and he goes free, and he goes to get one. Hello and welcome to this preview episode of Red Side of the Trend as we look ahead to match day seven and Sunday's visit to London and Stamford Bridge to face Chelsea. Joining me on this one is Louis from the Chelsea Echo. So first of all, Louis, thanks for coming on. How are you, mate? I'm not bad, mate. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. No problem at all. Right, we'll get straight into it then. Um, Fourth in the Premier League so far with 13 points from six games. You're also the league's top scorers and you've also progressed in the EFL Cup, beating League 2 Barrow and the Conference League playoff, beating Swiss side Servette. So what have you made of the season so far? It's been pleasantly surprising. I, I didn't actually have any expectations really when, when Chelsea brought in Enzo Maresca. I thought we were maybe set for another roller coaster season as we've seen over the past two years. And we still might be. It's very early doors. Um, but I've been pleasantly surprised by the football we've played, the freedom and the, and the progressive attitude the sides had. Um, consistently getting better, looking like we're finally getting him out of all the players which we spent a lot of money on. There was always a big discussion of, you know, could we find a, a use Caicedo and Enzo Fernandez together at the same time? Um, but it's 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 come together really nicely and um, long may it continue. Hmm. So obviously the outside football world um, was vastly surprised to see Maurizio Pochettino go. I'm, I'm sure you was exactly the same. Um, probably equally as a surprise to see Enzo Maresca, who won the championship last season, but has never managed in the Premier League until this season. So what did you make of all of that with Poch going and Maresca coming in? Um, Pochettino, I'm 50-50. I'm I was surprised, but only surprised because of how he finished the season. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was also not surprised because, to be honest, if you look with the benefit of hindsight, um after we lost 5-0 to Arsenal, you could tell that he almost didn't really really care anymore. He was going to be doing his way because he seemed like he knew he was out the door come the end of the season. Um, I thought he, he got a great string of results together. At the end, I thought he was going to be given that opportunity. Um, but evidently, that was never the case. And Zemreski was clearly someone that the club had, had really liked the look of for a long time. Uh, and like I was saying earlier, I just wasn't that impressed when they brought in Maresca, I, I didn't look at him and think, oh, my word, what a great coach to bring in. Done so well with Leicester, blah, blah, blah. But then um, he has left me uh, with a lot of egg on my face so far. He's, he's The way he speaks in press conferences and, and almost holds the attention of, of uh, the journalists and, and how he handles the team, uh, I have nothing but admiration for. And I, I think the way that he's been... Uh, dealing with the club in the position it's in with the ownership situation as well and how he's just getting the team to just play really good football at the same time look i'm i'm very very happy with it i think that he he's come in he, he's set a bar now um it's he heading into october i was actually looking at this thinking realistically i was thinking potentially you guys could be our first points of the season i thought we were really going to struggle against brighton struggle against west ham you know i was generally looking at it going when i say first points i mean first all your respect that's three points however you've gone and proved yeah. everyone wrong without how well you've been playing um, <laughs> yeah. but you know re re realistically i thought we we're really going to struggle but we put our best foot forward and we've been fantastic um the players in the side of cole palmer is cole palmer i think for me he's the best player chelsea have had since hazard he's been phenomenal and he really gets the seats flicking um whenever he plays football and not only because he's so good um, the team is playing well. You know, he's 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 a big reason for that, which means that you know the more, more space that we have for our other players, you know, Jaden Sancho, Nicholas Jackson, Noni Madueke, and that front four, including Cole Palmer. You know, we, we're really starting to, to string things together, and we're, we're looking great. And you know, Enzo Maresca is a big part of that. And the football he's playing, you know, not only is it, I mean, it's it had it's had a few howlers in terms of you know wanting to play possession based football, but that comes with the territory, unfortunately. But 
the way we've played, not only has it been, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of tippy tapping, but you know, we've held on what we've done in this situation. We've held on to the ball up. We've been extremely progressive and we've been aggressive on the front foot as well. So, you know, I'm, I've, I've been very impressed with the football we've been playing and I'm very, very happy that, you know, Enzo Marek has done such a good job at Chelsea. Hmm. Just um, to give a bit more insight, uh, because you hear a lot of stuff in the media and that, but obviously, you know, you had a change of ownership. Was it the start mm -hmm. of last season, wasn't it? So obviously... Uh, end of the 21-22 season. Yeah. So obviously Roman Abramovich, you know, was sanctioned by the UK government because of the invasion of Ukraine. He had to give up ownership of the club. Todd Bowley and his men come in. I believe it was the biggest sale of a club, wasn't it? Um, you guys, I believe, for what he paid. Yes, yes. 4.5 billion, I believe it was. Mm. Yeah, astronomical fee. So what, what have you kind of made of that? Because like I said, you hear so much in the media about basically the stereotypical is this dumb American, he's spending money, as Simon Jordan says on the tour, it's what like drunken sailor. So what have, there's now, obviously, mm -hmm. there was the rumour about him being an argument in the boardroom. So what have you kind of made of that transition from Abramovich to Bowley? And also, how do you see it playing out in the future, ownership-wise for Chelsea? Uh, well, it's not been pretty, has it? I think it, it, there's been a very, very tough change of hands. And I mean, it was always going to be, but I do believe those situations could have been dealt with better. Um, one thing which I think is incredibly unfair from, from journalists, and I think it shows that they haven't done as much research as they could have done over the past two years, um, to relay information either. Todd Bowley's really not very hands-on anymore at all. Okay. In fact, he was one people who wanted to step away from the beginning the only reason he's got the fact his name attached to it is because of that first transfer window uh since then um there's been two sporting directors put in place that have been in charge of football operations and also uh better Lake barley who is uh part of the clear lake consortium so obviously it was todd bowley and clear lake went in to to get chelsea football club uh, he's actually been far more hands-on and todd bowley's basically been not pushed to the side but you know, very much taken a back seat, uh, which is not something he wanted to do. He wanted to obviously, you know, he's been interested in buying a, a Premier League team since 2018. So it's been a while and obviously the opportunity for Chelsea rose and he, he jumped it and he hadn't worked with Clearlake before. So evidently it's, it's, it was an odd, it was an odd situation because I don't, the way it moved so quickly and the way things were being dealt with, there's never been an ownership sale like it. Um, and obviously he stepped in and, and took the club with, with Bedek Bali, but then Clear Lake are now wanting to basically put in all their own people and Todd Bowley's taking more and more of a back seat, but not through choice, hence why there's such a struggle with the ownership. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very much been an interesting few weeks in terms of analysing all of it. I think that, look, for me, I, I'm not a fan of how, how Clear Lake have done a lot of things. Uh, the sporting director's... You know, I think that they've they've been incredibly naive in some cases uh, and caught out almost doing what Manchester United were doing over the past five, ten years in terms of paying astronomical fees, which we didn't need to. Chelsea were always renowned for and in the Abramovich era for being fairly shrewd in their business and not really being able to have the, the wall put over their eyes in terms of deals. Whereas I think look, look at Moises Caicedo, Enzo Fernandez, the huge fees that are attached to those players purely because Chelsea were so desperate to get them. They were willing to pay anything. Yeah. Um, and that was mainly down to better egg barley and the sporting directors, Todd Bowley, again, very much backseat situation. Uh, and there's been a lot of clashes, Pochettino actually being one of them, you know, it was, uh, said after the Carabao cup final last year, that better egg barley wanted to get rid of Mauricio Pochettino. It took Todd Bowley a lot of convincing to try and stop him from doing that. Um, okay. in terms of how it's been playing out over the past few weeks, especially as you're alluding to with the, um, ownership situation, Look, it's going to be a slow process. Uh, Todd Bowley apparently is looking to to bring in investors and, and can source the funding to take over uh, Clear Lake. Clear Lake weren't initially in, in, inclined to sell um, purely because, obviously, as a hedge fund, they're managing it like a business, like a hedge fund. Um, problem with that is football is not like hedge fund. It's it's very it's it's a business, no doubt about it. But it's its own own animal. It's it's there's nothing like it in the world. It's not quite entertainment. It's not quite business. It's it's there's there's a a nuance to it which I don't think anyone else or any any other business in the world can really understand. And I think they're finally maybe starting to understand that. Touch wood. Um, <laughs> but you know, with with all that being said, look for me, 
I, if I was to pick a side, I'd, I'd probably go with uh, Bowley's model. Um, he really wasn't a fan of um, basically just signing kids uh, and aiming long term because obviously it was the neglecting of the mid term, which really affected the club. And um, obviously, you know, we've we've they've had to shift a lot of the, the finances purely because it was very much a case of Ryan Abramovich would just sign a check come the end of the season and cover the losses. Chelsea now on operating like that, um, and uh, that means obviously the the finances have changed and how we sign our players has changed, and you can't really attract the top level talent on what we're we're looking to do, and you can't just keep keep selling it on a project, especially when it's three or four years down the line. Whereas Todd Bowley very much wanted to obviously sign kids, sign some good youngsters. I think despite how ill fated that first window was, it was a good, relatively good example of just not not the the players we signed and the money we paid, but the element of signing that experience with a few really good youngsters and sort of like balancing it all out. And that's more of what Top Bailey wants to do because he wants to keep Chelsea competitive. Uh, and as much as we're, we know we're top four, we're looking good. You know, it's very early doors in the season. I don't, I don't want to start hanging my hat on everything and without knowing what's going on, really. It's, it's not something I do. I'm very excited for what's happening this season, but you know, with how Chelsea are operating, we'll have to see. Um, but, Look, I think that, you know, the Clear Lake and the sporting directors have been in charge of Chelsea really since that January window. So, uh, what, September or oh, sorry, uh, summer 2022 was really the only window that Top Bailey had in control. Ever since then, it's very much been pushing into the side and these sporting directors and uh, Clear Lake Capital, who have wanted to basically, they have brought in this this transfer dream team strategy. The reason there's two sporting directors is because Better Egg Barley wants to micromanage. Top Bowley didn't want to micromanage, so already there was massive issues and pretty much everything you were hearing about what's happening at Chelsea, which fans disagree with, I'd say about seventy percent of the time, Top Bowley agrees. He thinks that there's a lot of issues. Um, and for me, look, I, I think that how Clear Lake have done it. It very much is business orientated. It's very much focused on like running like a hedge fund. Whereas what I really like about Todd Bowley is his investments lie solely in really emotive things. So um, he owns a large collection of Bruce Springsteen's music uh, and obviously all the rights to them. He owns film companies. He owns uh, obviously the LA Dodgers, you know, things which have an element of emotion attached to it, which means he maybe has more of an understanding or more of an appreciation maybe probably the better use of word for what football is especially as, as a product whereas recently um chris jurisek who was the ceo of chelsea for the past few months was uh already very much disliked by fans and has left recently after he called fans customers that was a clear lake hire clear lake very much looking to push the customer relations side of things the business side of things it's an entertainment it's a property it's something which we can um shift on to any punter rather than sort of really looking at people that have been loyal to the club for a long time i mean people like myself look i go to the game i maybe i maybe get a bite to eat at the ground i'm really hungry i try to avoid it so i'm trying to cut down trying to lose weight um <laughs> but you know i'm very much sort of like i i maybe i go to the game i take my seat i watch the football i'll go in. that's very much my thing i don't really invest financially into the into the club and in in terms of what they would want which is somebody who would not only come to the game but they'll buy food outside the ground they'll then go to the mega store they'll then maybe stay at the hotel they'll put you at the restaurants i'm very much in out maybe i'll have a pint afterwards with some friends at the bar but aside from that it's it's very much a case of you know that that, that we're not the sort of punch they want but that, that's just the way football's going really so I don't know. We'll have to see. I know it was a very long-winded answer, but, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you plenty of background. I mean, we're the exact same now. Forest, our ticket prices have gone up a lot. Um, they're obviously just brought, they've just built this temporary structure in one of the corners of the ground for um, corporate and that. So it's just the way the Premier League, um, you know, it's not one singular club in the Premier League and all the others are, you know, lo love, absolutely adore the fans. The truth is, we are fans are in the, in the Premier League are treated like customers, unfortunately. But um, that's another discussion. But we'll we'll talk about one of the post well, the poster boy of that of all you all the buys you you like basically say, similar to us of just buying loads of players. Um, I'm a big England fan as well, so I was 
really disappointed to not see Cole Palmer start a game in the um, Euros in the summer. You know, he obviously scored the goal in the final, what got us level. You know, he started this season on fire, six in six. He's also got four assists. Obviously scored four on Saturday against Brighton after I took him out in the FPL to get some budget and stuck Nicholas Jackson in because he was three million less. <laughs> he obviously also won Young Player of the Year last season for the Premier League. So he's probably... And, you know, Pep Guardiola very rarely makes mistakes. He seems to be one. So what have you made of his time at Chelsea so far? Like I said to you earlier, he's, he's, he's the best player in the team. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. And he, he is phenomenal. I, I had my reservations after or at the start of the season because I thought, right, maybe he could be a flash in the pan. Maybe they'll have figured him out. Maybe we won't see the best of him. Uh, Cole Palmer is... Um, I, I'm probably going to make a statement. I was actually trying to figure out an answer to this. I think there's probably only one player in the world right now who's better than Cole Palmer or playing better than Cole Palmer. Um, and that's Harry Kane in the Bundesliga. Um, I mean, you could talk about Vinicius Jr. You could talk about Mbappe. Mbappe has not been firing for Real Madrid. Vinicius Jr. has been good, but the numbers he's putting out are nowhere near the level of Cole Palmer's. Mm. Um, he, he's been phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And there's no doubt that Chelsea were pulled to uh, where they were in the table last year purely because of him. You know, he, he's someone who has really flourished uh, at Chelsea. Obviously, he was playing on the right-hand side this year, played a more central role this season, and he's been even more influential. Um, he's somebody who has really delivered on multiple occasions. He is amazing at football and it is very much like a rain man sort of thing going on there because when he talks about what he's playing as football and how he has his chippy tees if he does well or uh when he was talking about the free kick against brighton he just went yeah i just don't really practice i just hit it and it kind of went in i'm like what is like it's it's unbelievable it's it's this guy is just so simple a man of simple pleasures as well and he loves playing football and he's good at it as well i mean what more can you want absolutely fantastic yeah, I saw um, a bit of his interview the other day on Talksport where he was actually quite disappointed. He'd not scored five <laughs> and not being happy that, that he scored. Right. He said he, he said he missed a chance second half. Was it? I've not. I've only seen the free kick. So um, yeah, I've just got some stats here. This is off Monday Night Football last night. So you you spoke about the goal involvement. So this is major European league since September 2023. So he's second behind Harry Kane. So Kane on 49. Palmer on 43. Just some of the names is above. Haaland, Mbappe, Lewandowski, Salah, Saka, Vinicius Jr., Phil Foden, Jude Bellingham. I mean, and with respect, this is for a team who, you know, if you listen to the media a lot, we're in absolute state of flux at times last season. So We absolutely were. It, 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 it's some going, I must say. Um, yeah, he's a top plan. Like I said, I was really disappointed not to see him get more minutes in the Euros. The game last season, what it did, because the Everton game, he got. Did he get a hat trick or four in that game? I think it was a hat trick. On he got four against Everton. Yeah, well. four. Yeah. So that we play, we played them after in a big relegation battle and lost to them, of course. And you know, I was like rubbing my hands together, thinking, "Oh, look, he's absolutely ripped them apart." But as they do, have Everton come back with a vengeance. But um, we'll chat like briefly about a few others. I've just picked out a few kind of signings, really. So. What have you made of Jaden Sancho so far? He's obviously had a tough time at Man U. Yeah. As he started at Chelsea. Um for me, Jaden Sancho so far is is really cut the mustard. He's done well. Three games, three assists, numbers look great. Um he still has that street footballer in him a little bit where sometimes it's really exciting, and other times you want to tear your hair out because there's a simple pass on with a nice little move down the left-hand side, and he just decides to try and not make three people. It's like, okay, can, can you not make? Can we just sort of play a bit of simple football here? And then you can do that a bit further up the picture and there's less to worry about. Um, he is looking great. Um, again, like I said, with Enzo Maresca, that's how I'll keep it consistent. I'm excited. He looks fun. I enjoy the football, but it's very early doors. But he's been great so far. Someone who also started the season well, and um, I think it was a bit of split last season. What I read, Nicholas Jackson? What What do you make of him? 
Um, I was very much somebody who was not a not the biggest fan of Nicholas Jackson at times at the beginning of last season. I'd be tearing my hair out again, simple decisions. But um, he seems to have matured a lot. Uh, 17 goals last season, really not a bad return for a £30 million striker at all. Someone who was also, you know, levied with the responsibility of of wearing the the, the number nine shirt for Chelsea, uh, which is never fun. Obviously, he wears the number 15, but everyone knows what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, he this season has matured even more. And obviously, there's all the talk of Victor Ossiman coming to Chelsea in the summer. Uh, and he seems to have taken that quite personally, especially after John Adam McKell was on that train of trying to get Victor Ossiman because he didn't think Jacks could do it. Um, he links up the play very well. He does the simple stuff very well. His finishing can always improve, as, with, as we can with any striker. But if Chelsea keep playing as dangerously as they are, he's going to get more opportunities, which means he has more opportunity to score, which means, guess what? More chances of the ball to go back to the net. And that sounds very obvious, and that is very obvious. It's a very Michael Owen comment there, but it's true. <laughs> Hence why he was so good against West Ham. We had multiple opportunities, and he absolutely turned them over on multiple occasions. But not only was I saying about you know how important he is with Cole Palmer, the link-up there is fantastic. You know, it's the way that he can bring the ball down, nod it forward. I haven't seen a striker link up play like that since Diego Costa. Um, and that was a long time ago. Oh, uh, so, you know, yeah, yeah, I love, I love, I miss it. I miss him. But Nick, Nicholas Jackson's got a different sort of shit out in him, and I'm a big fan of that. So, you know, it's getting better constantly, and he's only going to improve. Um, so, long may it continue. Yeah. Hopefully a blank on Sunday and then he can start firing for the FPL team again. But um, I was going to say, he's in so, the FPL, mate. You can't have him as a blank, surely. I'll, I'll blank. If, if it needs Forrest to get a result, we'll blank. We'll do that. <laughs> um, someone who was really good at ours last season in that absolutely crazy game, which we'll talk about in a bit, was uh, Michaela Mudrick. Nah, mm-hmm. he, he really impressed me that game. But then I watched him other times and thinking, this guy, I think, was it 80-odd million you paid for him? And just like 65 rising, oh, was potentially it? 80 odd. So the, the, the media kind of, it's an like do with me, like every, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we, we signed like Morgan no Gibbs White for an initial fee of 25 million, but in the media it was 45 million. We signed technically signed Elliot Anderson this season for 15 million, but in the media it's 35 million. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so what, what do you kind of make it? He's obviously not playing much, is he, at the minute? So, what do you kind of make of him? Do you think he's got a future um, at Chelsea still? He's very much a player who they are looking at as the uh, – he's like an understudy right now. Um, mm. I don't know how much more of runway he's got at Chelsea. I, I think there's a player in there. Whether or not you'll see it in a Chelsea shirt, it's another conversation. His is confidence is completely shot. He's just not the same player that people saw and uh, were entertained by uh, over the past uh, – few months or for well a few months were entertained by when he was playing for Shakhtar Donetsk um he has those moments his decision making really isn't great at all um again it's some things you can't coach and there's some times where you just see Moreski tearing his hair out um I think that there's a real opportunity for him to develop I personally would like to see him on loan I think that would really, really benefit him. I think if he has an opportunity for regular football, completely new league, no pressure on him whatsoever, and just to go show he's capable of, I'm looking at sort of like France, maybe there's obviously that's man who get the best out of him. Obviously, some players in that team we shall mention, but you know we'll have to see. I think you know I, th- I think that um, you know I think Mikhailo Modric could do that. I think he could do well in Italy. I think he could do really, really well in Germany. But he just needs regular minutes. And right now, he's not going to get that choice because, quite frankly, he's not proven why he should. Having said that, though, Mareska bangs on about how important it is to have players that are good trainers who work hard, who do everything. Mikhailo Madrid does all of that. Um, mm. So maybe he'll get given the opportunity, but he needs some runway and he needs some regular football. And right now, unfortunately, when it comes to the 90 minutes, he's not delivering. So I, I, I like him a lot still, um, but I know that a lot of other people are, are tired of Mikhailo Madrid already. Yeah, because he must have something about him because everyone bangs on about how good Arsenal's recruitment is and they, they've they chased him pretty much to the death, didn't they, with you? I think you just basically, I guess, in our bit, this is again, the me- I'm listening to the media, it's just basically... No, no, we did. We, 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 I think we very, I think that window, we just went, we just want to get him because him yeah. and his Arsenal yeah. won't. 
Um, and he, he would have been an understudy then at Arsenal as well, but they were looking at 60 odd million to sort of bed him in slowly. Unfortunately, yeah. Chelsea didn't have that and signed every other player under the sun. And he basically walked into um, a massive situation at Chelsea, which I don't think anyone would have flourished. I was saying, I think over the past, probably maybe I'd argue from December onwards last year, it would actually been all right. Before then, I think you could have put Carlo Ancelotti, Alex Ferguson, Pep Guardiola, some of the best minds in the game in Chelsea at that point in time, and you'd have seen a similar situation. It was a mess. It was an absolute mess. And um, it was something which was only going to cause more problems than benefits. Now it's kind of slowing down and we're tidying up a little bit. Then... You know, we'd like to think that the, the positives are now going to outweigh the negatives over the next 18 months. But, you know, it was going to be a, a hell of a, a fiery two years. And I'm hoping we're past that now. So maybe Mikhail Madrid might come good at Chelsea. But realistically, I think January, if the right offer comes in, they'd consider it. Yeah, there is similarities between you and us. Like we, you obviously had a new ownership and you was trying to build a squad. We obviously come from the championship with a wafer thin squad, so we was trying to build a squad as well. So the turnover of player for both clubs over the last probably, you know, last season and the season before, especially for us, has been massive. But now we've kind of slowed down as you have. So there is similarities in that. You know, one player I'm glad you've got rid of is Raheem Sterling because. He's got four yeah, and four back. against us in the prem, so at least he can't score for yourselves against us, but obviously could do with Arsenal. Um, what do you make of... Because this is, again, a player... So this is a little bit of a you know, kid story, but basically I always kind of follow players who I sign on Football Manager and FIFA. Obviously. So, <laughs> one of, so as a lot right. of people do. So quite a while back now... Um, Barcelona youngster Mark Cucurella was my FIFA left back and I loved him. So obviously seeing he came to Brighton, I thought, oh, cool. I think he was a good Getafe then. And then obviously yourself sign him. Um, and then at the back end of last season, I thought he actually got quite, improved quite a lot when I watched him. And then, But then the, the media's perception, I think Gary Neville was very strong on this during the Euros, was that he's still really poor. And then he had obviously had an incredible Euros, annoyingly set up the winner for Spain in the final. So apart from his antics, which I don't like, but obviously if you're a Chelsea fan, you have to go with them. Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you make of him now? He's the second name on the team sheet for me. I think yeah. he, he's stabilised massively. He's been fantastic. I thought against Brighton, a little bit of Latin fury. Uh, same with Moises Caicedo as well. I think it was a case of up against the former side, Brighton fans booing for no reason whatsoever because they're idiots. I could go on for ages about Brighton. They do my heading. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, look, he he's definitely been someone who has improved massively and has, has been very stable for Chelsea. Um, since he's been doing that inverted fullback role rather than bombing up and down, which he didn't have the pace for, he's actually become so much more in control and so much more capable as that extra outlet for the midfield and for the defenders and just being able to control the ball a bit more, um, which obviously then means also you got Malo Gusto or Rhys James, who knows if he'll be fit. Yeah. Well, if you stick it on the right-hand side, those guys can do what they're good at and bomb up and down. And it means that if he's inverting, it looks well. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd be very happy with, with Mark Cookeray. And again, I'm just saying it because we saw that he was fairly poor to begin with. And I can only hope he gets better, as I can with everyone else. Long may it continue. And I keep saying it, but that's because, look, the past two and a half years, I've been sat watching Chelsea wanted to tear me out half the time. <laughs> now I'm very much in the position of, right, we're actually playing all right here. Let's continue it. Let's get better and let's hope that, that we can just keep pushing forward. Yeah. Obviously, out of all these signings, just to wrap up basically this, who's kind of the most underrated, would you say, and who's been the worst? Oh, what well, all the signings that Chelsea have made? Yeah, of, of like like the kind of Bowley egg barley era. Who would you say is the most yeah. underrated and the worst? Uh I would say apologies that. Sorry, someone's calling me. Um right, what worst I'd probably say is Khalidu Koulibaly. <laughs> Hands down, he was awful. Yeah, um, Tyra, Tyra, one you made 
really troubled him when we drew one one at ours in the first season oh, we come up. See, I, I like Arwani. Yeah. I really like him. I was I was always saying if we had to get a second choice striker, I'd been all over it personally. Yeah. Um. But you know him and then the best is I mean from the fellas I was playing against Cole Palmer. I mean, yeah. but if, should, if you, are you going to say without Cole Palmer? So that makes yeah, I'm interesting. saying like most like underrated. So somebody you, you might not spring to somebody's mic. Yeah, best. I think everyone would say Palmer, but like maybe yeah, someone who's Jackson. gone under the radar a little bit. Jackson, I don't think he gets Jackson. the the, the props he deserves. I think he's been fantastic, mm. and he's getting better and better, and the numbers are speaking for themselves. Um, yeah. I think about the FA Cup semi final against Man City, where he was playing out on the left and was coming inside. He didn't get the goal. But he was running rings around Carl Walker. But, you know, it's it, it doesn't suit what a lot of people just wanted to say about him. Um, he's been getting better and better consistently. Yeah. Yeah, well, our, um, your former academy player, Alarina, absolutely blew Kyle Walker last season when we played them at ours, which everyone was like, well, that was just kind of happening because he, like, jogged by him like he wasn't even there. So, um, so yeah, we will move on to Forrest. And somebody who... Uh, obviously, he's come through your academy. And he's now with us. He's Callum Hudson Adoy. He's, you know, first season he started. He scored an absolute worldie against Burnley. Then it kind of phased off for him at the back end of the season. The chop inside onto his right foot and whipping it into the corner has been obviously a massive threat for us. He scored the winner at Anfield this season, doing exactly the same. Was you? Do you think it was for the best? For you, for Chelsea and him to have that clean break, or you was you a little bit disappointed? He went. Uh, I think it was for the best. He, he he wasn't really performing to the level he's performing now, and he was on a massive contract, and that was a big thing that the club wanted to get rid of. He had a year left. It was on I think a hundred grand a week. Wasn't really playing. Was injured a lot, or wasn't really taking opportunities when they were given to him. Okay. Um, and he just seems to be playing with a lot more freedom now. Um, I think there was that big weight on his shoulders at Chelsea, you know, Academy product was, you know, linked to Bayern when we first got in, mm. you know, all this sort of stuff where we turned down all these offers because we really thought he was going to be the next big thing. Yeah. And, you know, a big injury in that 18, 19 season really hindered his progress and he never really recovered from it. Mm. Whereas now he's playing with freedom. He's getting better and better constantly. Um, people talk about, you know, we should have kept him and we should have signed Mikhail Mudrick. Yeah, may maybe. Maybe, but that's the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's a very much a case of one bit better, and I hope he gets better and I hope he continues to do well. Was you, I mean, because we're all kind of amazed, really. I know he obviously had the injury and he, he had that loan spell at Bayer Leverkusen where I don't think it worked out, but we were kind of all still amazed that we only got him for three million. Did, did you think that was a massive undervaluation? Because with obviously that potential stuff, I thought you probably still could have got maybe, I don't know, 15 million for him, but was it just a case of just wanting his wages off just, the book? It was just wages and black belt, uh, blue belt value, sorry. I just wanted to get rid of him and just be like, yeah, yeah. cool, it's what's like, this much is worth less, just take it and run. They just wanted to get that money off the door and it was pure profit as well. I mean, yeah, he probably could have got more, but, you know, so Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, someone you, you probably, I, I doubt you'd have seen this player much, but we also had someone on loan from you last year in Andre Santos, and that turned out to be an absolute disaster. He's gone to Strasbourg now, hasn't he, on loan. I think he's doing quite well there. What, do you, what Have you seen much of him for Chelsea? Or, do you know, no, he's not played for Chelsea. Him? He's not no. played for Chelsea. I've seen him he's a, just a on loan. Couple of, he's on loan. He's, he's had a couple of moments here and there in pre season. Yeah. But he seems to be killing it on Strasbourg when mm. Steve Cooper was an idiot. Didn't play him. That was <laughs> his um, he walk. He walks into your midfield, or he wa he would have walked into your midfield at that point, and he just didn't want to play him. So, mm. don't know what was going on there. But you know, I thought that was a great signing for you lot, and he just he just wasn't used. Yeah, ba basically, apparently the story goes that Cooper didn't even know he was coming, and it was basically the owner's son was getting involved and signed him, and then apparently like rocked up, and he didn't even know he was signing. So I don't think it's with a manager when you don't sign a player they want. I think you're off to a bad start, aren't you, straight away? So. Did a shame that one didn't really work out. But um, talk about last season between both sides. So we, you know, it was a famous win for us at the time. Beat you um, one nil at Stanford Bridge. I was on holiday for that game, so I was watching it in Greece, um, and I just couldn't believe that Chelsea were just lumping balls into the box when we had McKenna, Bolly, and Warrell, who all big six foot guys. Right. I think you had Sterling up there, and I was like, we're going to like win this because. They're just not going to 
They're just doing the wrong thing, and it's, it's so obvious. Not, uh, and then obviously, I'm getting flashbacks. I right? yeah. <laughs> obviously at our ground, we technically bar a massive swing stayed up that day. So we, you know, with ten minutes to go, Hudson Adoy does his cut inside bottom corner, and we're thinking, you know, we're we're gonna at least definitely go to last day and we're mathematically safe apart from the swing and then all of a sudden we completely collapse so what what did you make of the games against forest last season start with the one at yours i mean the one the one at ours i very much just kind of just didn't want to think about it <laughs> i just want to move on <laughs> it was it was one of those games where chelsea capitulated and it is what it is mm. um that was early doors in the season and we could have done it better was, yeah. but, you know where it was where it is but you know end of last season it's a fun day out for me i'm not complaining <laughs> what's it what's it like as an away fan forest ground i've not been yet i've not oh, okay. I've, it's, it's still on my list when i when i say okay. it's a fun day out i was talking about chelsea in general um but oh, you know right. I've, I've, i want forest okay. ground very very high up on my list okay what's um your kind of thoughts on forest what you've seen as as maybe since we've come back up obviously against chelsea and especially this mm. season what have you kind of made of forest I mean, you stayed up by the skin of your teeth the first season. Second yep. season, Nuno kind of just did what he did. I've got a real thought that you guys might kick on now. I think you've got a very good squad. I think what Nuno did, Nuno did at Wolves is a very good example. Um, and I, I really think that maybe you guys could get really comfortable with him. I think you'll be a solid Premier League side for the next few years, no doubt about it, if you keep hold of him and you keep doing well. Yeah, we lost to your lesser neighbours on um, Saturday, unfortunately, in Fulham in the most nil-nil game you'll ever see. And the referee, VAR, decided to give a debatable penalty and then um, denied us one and didn't send him to the screen. So it's not so very frustrating at the weekend. But um, we'll kind of move on to the game then on Sunday. I know you guys have got it's Ghent into it midweek in the Conference League. I'm not sure. I, I know Cole Palmer isn't in your squad for that, annoyingly for us. So I'm guessing, are you guys kind of take not taking that seriously, or? Oh, oh, I, I very much hope that Chelsea are taking it seriously. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at this as an opportunity for silverware, and that's what this club needs right now. It needs mm. to make that step. Now we reached two, we reached two, well, a final last year, semi final against Man City as well, which we should have won as well. Yeah. League Cup final, less said the better. Should have won that. Didn't. <laughs> yeah, I watched it. Um. But, you know, this is a real opportunity for silverware. Mm. Trip to Poland, have a few, like one euro or whatever it is, uh, beverages and, and off we go. But I'm really hoping they take it seriously and we can we can do the right things. But are you surprised not to see Palmer in the squad then or do you think that's the right decision? Yeah. They, they'll they'll add him in January should Chelsea get through right. the, knock, uh, the knockout round, which we should do. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, just um, Sunday then. Just give us your prediction for your starting eleven. What do you expect to go with against us? I mean, I very much am in a position of. I'd like to think that um, it'll be this pretty strong side. So I'll probably be seeing uh, Sanchez in goal, um, which maybe isn't the strongest start. Uh, Cook around left back, right back Gusto, centre halves Colwell and Fafana who are making a really good partnership now. Defence midfield, I think we're going to look at Caicedo and we're going to look at uh, Enzo Fernandez, number 10 Cole Palmer, right wing Madueke, left wing we're going to be looking at Sancho and up front you're probably going to see Jackson. Pretty straightforward, isn't it, that nowadays? Um, and finally, mate, your prediction for the game. Oh, I'm not a predictions guy. I can't do it. I'm. 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 I'll, I'll just hope it's a Chelsea win. Okay, we'll take. Well, we just hope if we can get any, if we can get a point or even a win, same as last year, we'll take that as well. So, uh, yeah. No. So, <laughs> but as away form has been incredible. Um, his last five away games, we've won four and drew one. Obviously, beat Liverpool as you know. We've, we've got to milk that as much as we can. Um, so yeah, it's just his home form. I just mentioned that last five away, one four is home four. We're not one in seven at home now. And under Nuno, we've only won three and 18 at home. So he seems to find the formula away. 
It's just that home is the problem, whereas Steve Cooper was pretty decent at home and he was absolutely terrible away. So we just mm. kind of need to find that balance for us to have a solid season. But thank you for coming on, mate. I appreciate yeah, it. Do you want to anything to shout out your podcast and that before we wrap yeah, it up? Yeah, listen, if you guys want to see the full Chelsea perspective where I actually don't talk about Chelsea as much as we should do, I think we spent about... 15 minutes talking about why tofu is rubbish uh last week so you know if people want to check that out check out the chelsea echo um it's a great stuff we get press access as well so we do stuff with the club uh and we'll be uh, hopefully doing a lot more stuff really cool stuff with chelsea players and uh or former chelsea players and and you know getting involved um so a real insight into things and not just screaming down a camera it's not really what we do um but yeah if, if you want to come get involved check it out it's good good fun uh, and if you're in London and you need a haircut and you want someone who can talk shit for over 45 minutes, or well, you've just been listening to it, so uh, let give drop us a line if you want a good trim. You're in the West London area. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Louis. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. I hope you've enjoyed it. Whoever listens to it, and um, we'll be back on Monday evening to discuss what happens at Stamford Bridge on Sunday. But until then, thank you for watching slash listening, and come on, you Reds.